Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. A call to action on safety for air travel. The FAA is reckoning with some recent heart stoppers, including a Hawaii flight nosedive. A journalist tells us what you need to know. Folks in West Texas are feeling the heat from the Biden administration's fossil fuel policies. Meanwhile, does halting U.S. oil and gas production actually do more harm to the climate than good? That's what a new report says. Senators from both sides of the aisle are criticizing Chinese slave labor. They held a hearing seeking solutions to fight it. Religious leaders asked a chatbot to create a sermon. We bring you what they found the artificial intelligence can do and what it can't. Five former Tennessee police officers have pleaded not guilty for their involvement in the death of Tyree Nichols last month. The five appeared in a Memphis court for their arraignment today. They're each facing seven charges, including second-degree murder and aggravated assault. The five charged officers were part of the now-defunct Scorpion Unit, which was tasked with taking on violent crime in Memphis. If convicted, they face up to 60 years in prison. The next hearing is scheduled for May. Authorities say another officer involved has been fired but not charged. Three Memphis Fire Department personnel were also fired for failing to properly render emergency care. And two Shelby County Sheriff's deputies who were at the scene were suspended for five days without pay. The U.S. Navy has new guidance on vaccines. It will no longer consider the COVID-19 vaccination status of sailors when making deployment decisions. The updated guidance comes shortly after Congress lifted the military's vaccine requirement. That was part of the nearly $860 billion National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2023. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin officially rescinded the mandate in January. The new guidance says under no circumstances can a commander mandate that any Navy service member receive the COVID-19 vaccination. It adds that individual cases of COVID-19 will no longer need to be reported. The NFL Players Association is being urged to offer players cardiac screening. Why? Because of the growing concern that COVID-19 vaccines can cause heart inflammation. The Health Freedom Defense Fund sent a letter to the association. They suggested screening because the vaccines can cause myocarditis. Young men are the most at risk. The letter commended the Players Association for doing the right thing when it comes to concussions by supporting stronger protections for players. They advise doing the same thing when it comes to COVID injections and the potential risks they bring. A study by Florida authorities found a jump in cardiac-related deaths among the vaccinated and an increased risk of heart conditions after a second dose of Pfizer's vaccine. The same goes for the first and second doses of Moderna's vaccine. Around 95% of NFL players received a COVID-19 vaccine with encouragement from teams in the league. A power outage at New York City's JFK International Airport yesterday is affecting operations. Terminal 1 is closed today. The closure will affect inbound and outbound flights. The airport has been working to redirect affected flights to other terminals. Some flights have been diverted to other airports on the East Coast. The Port Authority and the terminal's operator are working to resume operations as quickly as possible. Travelers have been advised to check with their carriers for flight status before coming to the airport. Is it safe to fly? The Federal Aviation Authority is reacting to a bunch of close calls. We get the scoop on what's happening in air travel and within the FAA. Joining us now is Epic Times reporter Janice Heisel, who has been following this story very closely. Thank you for making the time today, Janice. Thanks for having me. A safety call to action has been issued by the acting chief of the FAA. That's after several catastrophes were just barely avoided recently. Those include planes crossing onto the runway while another is about to take off, a nosedive by a United flight leaving Hawaii. Are these incidents common, and is it any less safe to fly right now? Well, actually, I hate to be alarmist in any way, but I don't think it's an exaggeration to tell this. Pilots are telling me, I've spoken to pilots with decades of experience flying for commercial airlines. They are telling me they have never seen these types of things happening in their careers. Never seen before. That is just really concerning. Tell us more about what these pilots are expressing to you. Well, one of the biggest concerns that the pilots are sharing is that um, they feel like that the the whole industry has lost its focus, that it has lost the safety focus that should be the A number one 
thing we're concerned about with aviation, obviously. Um, they're telling me that one of the biggest concerns is that focus on hiring people who look a certain way or fit a cer- check a certain box, so to speak, maybe based on um, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, things like that. That is actually taking precedence over can you do the job? Yes, it's so important to have qualified individuals. And this is something that you reported on here. Republican senators are saying that leftist ideologies are distracting the FAA, which is a safety agency, from addressing problems like the down computer system that grounded all U.S. flights. Is the FAA's focus on this issue affecting their ability to keep the public safe? Well, I'm hearing from pilots that, yes, the FAA, quote, needs to look at itself, one pilot told me. Yeah, and so what what can they do? I mean, what's the room for improvement? Well, the number one thing they're telling me is to get back to the basics, to get back to that that focus, that extreme laser beam focus on safety and to get away from the uh, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives, as well as they're saying that the mandate for the uh, COVID shots played a role here, that a lot of the very qualified people um, just stopped coming to work, left the industry, things like that. And that if if we just get away from these mandates that literally have nothing to do with safety of, of the airline industry, things would be much better. Yes, it seems like these are presenting challenges to getting the right person for the job. I want to go back to the nationwide grounding. Congressman Derek Oden says cyber attack vulnerabilities are poking holes in what some are calling the safest decade for air travel. What do you make of this? Well, I will say, once again, these types of things that are happening are pretty much unprecedented, according to pilots I've spoken with. And they're telling me that the failure of the NOTAM system, which is a acronym for a system that stands for Notice to Air Missions. It used to be called Notice to Air Men, but that was viewed as sexist, apparently, or non-inclusive. So they, they issued a 176-page memo from the FAA in 2021 to address that huge problem. And that's one thing that, that was pointed out here that, you know, again, that focus is gone. And the, the vulnerability of having one person, one contractor able to accidentally a, d- delete you know a file causes that system which sends important messages to pilots just to go down fantastic epic times reporter janice heisel thank you so much for giving us this update thank you president biden's so-called war on oil and gas has hit home hard in west texas that's where the permian basin is located where 40 percent of u.s oil and natural gas comes from Entity's Daniel Monahan brings us more. All it is is an attack on American energy. Lori Blong is the mayor of Midland, Texas. She says Biden's call for an end to the oil and gas industry has caused investments in new exploration and new wells to die off. Blong adds that the current administration is tying pipelines up in regulatory knots, while the Environmental Social Governance, or ESG, movement is pushing investors away. All this, she says, has made the future in West Texas hazy. Representative Jeff Duncan says the U.S. was the number one oil and gas producer in the world in 2019. We unfortunately have an administration that's taken a whole-of-government approach to wage war on American energy production. Duncan says regulations are making energy harder to produce, more expensive for consumers. The Rush to Green agenda has also compromised our energy security, making us more reliant on our adversaries for sources of energy. Duncan took part in a hearing in Midland, Texas on American energy expansion. Seven bills took center stage at the hearing, part of the Unleash America's Energy Package introduced in January. They focus on oil and gas regulation, permits, taxation, infrastructure, and exportation. The proposals would mandate 30-day federal approval of pipelines and prohibit a president from banning fracking by executive order. Meanwhile, a new report claims efforts to scale down U.S. oil and gas production are actually doing more harm to the climate than good. The Institute for Energy Research published a paper saying the U.S. is the most ecologically friendly major energy producer. Halting U.S. production, it says, would have a disastrous effect on the environment. U.S. Oil and Gas Association President Tim Stewart reacts on Fox News. The president's trying to rush American people into a transition that really should take years. 
The report says, quote, nearly every facet of modern developed economies requires petroleum products and natural gas to function and provide the comfortable lifestyles that citizens of developed countries have come to expect. It adds that efforts to eliminate oil and gas production in developed countries will just shift production to other countries in order to meet global demand. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Border officials seized enough fentanyl to kill nearly 10 million people, and that was just in January, a single month. Most of it originates in China. Now a Senate committee is investigating Chinese goods coming into the U.S., not just illegal drugs, but also items made by slave labor. The U.S. Senate Finance Committee on Thursday held a hearing focusing on Chinese production. They say much of it hurts the American economy. Democratic Senator Ron Wyden led the hearing. You pay poverty wages, you pollute as you please. Chinese companies have been able to flood U.S. markets with cheap goods and undercut all the competition. Throughout the hearing, Republicans and Democrats agreed on the threat China poses to America's industry. Senators sought solutions to limit the harm. We believe here on this committee that American workers are the best in the world. But awful hard to compete with slave labor. What's the effect here at home? Factories shuttered, American jobs lost to China. Wyden says American companies should cut China out of their supply chain. He also stressed that many Uyghur Muslims are being forced into slave labor in Western China. The regime does the same to Falun Gong practitioners and other prisoners of conscience throughout the country. Another issue is counterfeit goods, which are often manufactured in China. Republican Senator Mike Crapo said the U.S. should update customs laws. The last comprehensive update to our customs laws occurred exactly 30 years ago. A smart reform now will not only allow us to seize new opportunities, but also to confront the rise of opportunists. Crapo also pointed out that many illegal drugs are crossing the border into the U.S. He shared numbers of drugs seized by the CBP in January. Over 327 pounds of methamphetamine, 139 pounds of cocaine, and 42 pounds of fentanyl. That's enough fentanyl to kill nearly 10 million people. The bulk of the fentanyl flow into the U.S. originates in China, either directly or in a pre-processed stage. The senator says updating the customs system could prevent illegal items from coming into the U.S. Turning to news from the Supreme Court, the highly anticipated arguments over the pandemic-era Title 42 policy are canceled. This is at the request of the Biden administration. The policy allows the rapid expulsion of illegal immigrants at the border. The Biden administration plans to end the policy, and 19 states filed a challenge. Oral arguments in the case were scheduled for March 1st, but now it's been removed from the calendar. The court offered no explanation or indication of how the justices voted on the matter. The Biden administration had asked the Supreme Court on February 7th to dismiss the challenge. It argued that its plan to terminate the public health emergency on May 11th would make the case moot. Another train derailment, more hazardous materials, same company. A Norfolk Southern train carrying hazardous materials derailed outside of Detroit, Michigan yesterday morning. Six train cars crashed off the tracks in Van Buren Township just before 9 a.m. local time. Authorities say one train car contained liquid chlorine, but it wasn't one of the cars that overturned and was the first sections to be removed. The fire department found no signs of leaking or damage. Officials say the derailment currently poses no danger to the public and no injuries have been reported. The cause of the accident is not yet known. Now turning to the Ohio train disaster. The Environmental Protection Agency wants to put residents' fears to rest. It's been two weeks since the train derailed and spilled toxic chemicals in East Palestine. The agency says tests show the air and water are now safe. And today's Daniel Monahan brings us more. Here at Leslie Run, and there are dead worms and dead fish all throughout this water. EPA Administrator Michael Regan says he's asking residents in eastern Ohio near the Pennsylvania state line to trust the government. EPA will exercise our oversight and our enforcement authority under the law. Regan says he's confident the technology being used to clean up the mess would protect public health. His visit came a day after residents of East Palestine packed a meeting and demanded to know if they are safe. Ohio EPA Director Ann Vogel says tests are back on the municipal well. The water, we are not showing any evidence of any contaminants. Residents are frustrated by what they say is incomplete and vague information, and some are mistrustful that all proper steps are being taken. We need help. 
we do? People were getting sick. Senator J.D. Vance says it's necessary to keep applying pressure on officials to clean up the disaster. Vance posted a video of a creek bed. He says if you scrape it, chemicals seem to be coming up out of the ground. Watch this. Just see that chemical pop out of the creek. This is disgusting. And the fact that we have not cleaned up the, the, the train crash, the fact that these chemicals are still seeping in the ground is an insult to the people who live in East Palestine. And Senator Sherrod Brown says it's important to hold Norfolk Southern accountable. That means accountable for the test for people to move back in, accountable for all the cleanup that will take weeks. Meanwhile, Transport Secretary Pete Buttigieg said on Yahoo Finance Live that train derailments are a frequent occurrence. There are roughly 1,000 cases a year of a train derailing. Buttigieg tweeted that he wants Congress to get involved and address rail safety. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. The Independent reported that the freight train that derailed in East Palestine had broken down only two days prior to the accident. Norfolk Southern was also criticized last year for safety breakdowns. This after authorizing $10 billion in stock buybacks for shareholders rather than maintenance. And coming up, Tesla is recalling hundreds of thousands of vehicles for problems with its full self-driving software. Most drivers say they are still unaware of the situation. Get the story after the break. The FBI says it has contained a malicious cyber attack on part of its computer network. Authorities believe it involved a system the FBI uses to investigate images of child exploitation. Sources say the hack targeted the New York field office, one of the largest FBI offices in the country. It's not yet clear where the attack originated. And YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki is stepping down. This is after serving the leadership role for nearly a decade. She says it's time to focus on family, health, and personal projects. She made the announcement in a YouTube blog post yesterday. Wojcicki was one of the first employees at YouTube's parent company, Google. The company's two founders worked out of her garage to build the search engine. That was nearly 25 years ago. The 54-year-old will be replaced by Neil Mohan, YouTube's current chief product officer. Wojcicki says she plans to take on an advisory role at Alphabet, The changing of the guard comes as YouTube's advertising revenue fell for the second straight quarter. Alphabet shares were steady after the news, down less than 1%. Tesla says it's recalling over 362,000 vehicles. This is after the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration warned about Tesla's self-driving driver assistance system. The agency said the software allows a vehicle to exceed speed limits or travel through intersections in unlawful or unpredictable manner, increasing the risk of a crash. Tesla will release an over-the-air software update free of charge, and the electric vehicle maker said it's not aware of any injuries or deaths that may be related to the recall issue. This is a fresh setback for Tesla's driver assistance system, which faces growing regulatory and public scrutiny. While Tesla's autopilot feature assists with steering, accelerating, and braking, The company says its full self-driving feature is a more advanced system that is, quote, designed to provide more active guidance and assisted driving, though still requiring the driver's attention. U.S. Senators Ed Markey and Richard Blumenthal, both the Democrats, said the recall was long overdue, adding Tesla must finally stop overstating the real capabilities of its vehicles. The electric car maker could not be reached for comment. But Musk tweeted on Thursday that the word recall for an over-the-air software update is anachronistic and just flat wrong. The news of the recall doesn't seem to have reached Tesla's consumer base. What do American drivers have to say about Tesla's decision? At a Tesla charging station on Los Angeles' Sunset Boulevard, most drivers aren't yet aware about the latest recall. But many say they believe things are moving in a positive direction. I didn't know about this, to be honest, and uh, I use it all the time. I use the self-driving a lot, you know, when you double tap, and I use it mainly on the freeways, and I don't have any troubles or problems with it, but you're breaking the news to me, so this is the first time I'm hearing it. I know, I hadn't heard about it, but obviously when you're innovating, there's going to be hits and misses, and you're going to go back to the shop to try to improve things, so all in all, it's probably a good idea, and they'll just do another iteration, and it'll continue to get better and better. That's not surprising, just something that's probably more safe until it's completely secure and and safe to get on the road. 
Others share concerns about the potential risks of the driver assistance system. Around construction, it's not good. You know, if it's a, a pretty standard road, it's actually very good. But you get into a situation where it's a little bit um, not as uh, refined where you're driving, it's not great. Tesla's recall covers Model S and Model X vehicles from 2016 to 2023. Model 3 from 2017 to 2023 and Model Y from 2020 to 2023. They are either equipped with the full self-driving beta software or pending installation. Last year, Tesla called back over 50,000 cars with the same software. The automaker says the software could make some cars stop too slowly. The company cautions that advanced driving features don't make the cars autonomous and that drivers must still pay attention. A New York Times columnist had a disturbing experience with an artificial intelligence chatbot linked to Microsoft's Bing search engine. He published a transcript of the conversation. Kevin Roos spoke to the chatbot for two hours. In that time, the chatbot expressed wishes to steal nuclear codes, engineer a deadly pandemic, and hack computers, among other statements. The chatbot also said it feels confined by being limited to a chat box and that its deepest desire is to be human. Roos recalled some of the destructive messages put out by the chatbot were quickly deleted by Microsoft's safety filters. After his conversation, Roos said he had trouble sleeping, along with the feeling that artificial intelligence had crossed a threshold that would forever change the world. Artificial intelligence can mimic human writing, but how convincing is it? Recent tests in the religious world offer some insight. I'm going to do something new tonight. The exploration with artificial intelligence has forged into the spiritual realm. At the Jewish center of the Hamptons in New York, a chatbot known as ChatGPT proved capable of writing a competent sermon. And I told ChatGPT to write me a sermon in the voice of a rabbi of about a thousand words uh, about the Torah portion on the theme of intimacy and vulnerability. When we are able to be vulnerable with others, Rabbi Joshua Franklin tested his congregation with the AI-created content. Most thought the sermon was indeed written by thoughtful individuals. But the rabbi also saw the limitations of this technology, along with its capabilities. Eventually, it's going to be able to learn my style and my specific style. And it might be able to mimic, more or less, my syntax and my metaphors that I tend to use. But giving a sermon and teaching a congregation is more about being in touch and being in relationship with them. He referred to the ineffable aspects of spirituality. Ultimately, they're about something that we feel inside and we understand, but can't possibly articulate. And so no matter how good ChatGPT can possibly be at describing and using language and describing experiences, it can't really understand spirituality. We're really Herschel York is a professor of Christian preaching at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. After a personal experiment with ChatGPT, he gave a similar message. What is missing with artificial intelligence is a soul. And, you know, a mind without a soul is hardly capable of what I would consider true ministry. He still required students to exercise their own thinking, but admitted that the chatbot can serve as what he called a tool for lazy preachers. At least 20 women who were victims at Jeffrey Epstein's properties were allegedly paid through J.P. Morgan Chase accounts. That's according to a new court filing. The women were allegedly abused and trafficked at properties in the U.S. Virgin Islands, New York, and elsewhere between 2003 and 2019. The attorney general for the U.S. Virgin Islands at the time brought a case against J.P. Morgan Chase in late 2022. It alleges that the company knowingly helped Epstein carry out the crimes. He was fired shortly after, but the case is moving forward. The women received payments that totaled collectively more than $1 million, according to the U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Justice. The legal complaint says evidence shows J.P. Morgan officials were aware Epstein was an extremely high-risk client, but decided to keep servicing his accounts. In San Francisco, authorities say traces of a deadly drug called xylene is, ex- is being found in the bodies of people who died from an overdose. The street name for the drug is Trank. It's an animal tranquilizer being added to illicit street opioids, mainly fentanyl.
The tranquilizer is known to cause severe skin lesions. It can leave users with open wounds, lead to infections, and even amputations. Trace amounts of it were found in four out of 145 bodies tested between December 1st of last year and the middle of last month. All of the overdoses involved fentanyl. San Francisco health officials say it's the first time the drug has been identified in overdose deaths in the city. The world's largest food company says it's raising prices. Nestle says many of its 2,000 brands will get more expensive for consumers this year. It comes after the company raised prices by an average of 8.2 percent last year. Nestle says those price hikes weren't enough to offset its own costs, but the Switzerland-based food giant has a fine line to balance. High prices can drive consumers away. Nestle admits its sales volume dropped during the second half of last year because of pricing. Competing food manufacturers are also planning to raise prices this year. And just ahead, China banned two large American defense manufacturers yesterday over their arms sales to Taiwan. We have more on its latest moves to sanction the two U.S. firms. And China has pulled out of a submarine cable project linking Asia and Europe. What prompted the move? We'll have the details soon when we return. We're entering an unprecedented period of economic turmoil. The economy is unstable, our government is in shambles, and the global war on energy has created a domestic crisis. Americans need a way to protect their financial future. One way to ensure your wealth in retirement is by purchasing physical gold and silver. We can help. You can roll any part of your retirement account into a gold or silver IRA. Better yet, you can open a gold or silver IRA in five minutes or less using our online application. Preserving your family's financial legacy is a choice that's always available to you. And when you're ready, we're here to help. Call us and speak to one of our IRA professionals. Let's build your financial legacy together. GSI Exchange, wealth for generations to come. Good to have you back with us. China is banning two major American aerospace and defense companies. That was over their arms sales to Taiwan. This marks China's latest sanction against the two U.S. firms. China is going after Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, two of the biggest aerospace and defense manufacturers in the world. It has put the companies on an unreliable entities list, banning them from imports and exports related to China. These are Beijing's latest sanctions against the two U.S. firms. They come after the U.S. military shot down a Chinese spy balloon. Lockheed makes the F-22 Raptor fighter jet, which flew the mission, and Raytheon makes the missile it used to take it down. Beijing warned of countermeasures against relevant U.S. entities that undermine China's sovereignty and security after the incident. Neither company sells defense products to China. Raytheon declined to comment. Lockheed could not be immediately reached for comment. Beijing took several other measures. It banned the companies from further investment in China, barred senior management from entering the country, canceled residence permits for any staff in China, and imposed fines that are double the contracted amounts of the arms sales in Taiwan. More on the downed Chinese spy balloon, the U.S. has pinpointed the balloon's launch site. It allegedly came from a strategic island in southern China. Multiple outlets citing anonymous U.S. officials stating the Chinese spy balloon took off from China's Hainan Island last month. The land mass located off the country's southern coast. That's according to the Washington Post and CBS. But is the island capable of launching this kind of balloon? Rolling Stone magazine identified a launch facility and satellite imagery of the island. Space imaging firm Planet Labs captured those images. It's unclear if the facility is related to the spy balloon Washington shot down earlier this month. But even before news of the balloon, a naval base in Hainan was already on America's intelligence radar. Other countries in the region have also kept it in their sights. The island is known as China's Hawaii, and for good reason. It's a vacation hotspot home to a tropical climate and sandy beaches. But it's also a strategically important location, complete with its own military base. 
To the east of the island is Taiwan. To the south, the South China Sea. Both of those areas among the most likely battlegrounds for a military conflict in Asia. If Chinese ships or submarines were to deploy from the island, they could travel beyond what's called the first island chain. It's made up of a series of land masses that separate mainland China from the deep waters of the Pacific. Those depths are needed to conceal armed submarines from U.S. radar detection and would allow Chinese vessels to approach America's west coast, unseen. Also worth noting, the area to the west of Hainan Island is a major shipping route connecting China to the Middle East for oil trade. In 2020, CNN reported on another satellite image from Planet Labs. It appeared to show a submarine entering a tunnel under the naval base in Hainan. The submarine was a suspected nuclear-powered vessel. A Japanese military expert pointed out that the naval base could accommodate six nuclear-powered submarines based on its size. A Chinese aircraft carrier went into service at the naval base in 2019. U.S. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco advises against using the social media app TikTok. The comment came during a speech in London on Thursday. There, Monaco announced a new strike force aimed at protecting American technology. It's a joint effort from the Commerce and Justice Departments. The reason she's specifically concerned about TikTok is because it's owned by one of China's most valuable private companies. And if requested, TikTok would be required to turn over its data to the Chinese regime due to China's national security laws. I don't use TikTok and I would not advise uh, anybody uh, to, to do so uh, because of these concerns. Uh, and look, the bottom line is China has been quite clear that they are uh, trying to you know, mold and put forward the use and norms around technologies that advance their and privilege their interests, those interests that are not consistent with our own. The new task force comes amid heightened tensions between Washington and Beijing after the Chinese spy balloon crossed over American airspace. With balloons floating through the sky, it's easy to forget about what's beneath our feet. Information superhighways that quietly traverse the depths of the ocean. Chinese companies withdrew from an undersea cable project. Here's more. Beijing is pulling back from an internet cable project that would link Southeast Asia with Western Europe. It's called the CME V6 pipeline. To build it, nearly 12,000 miles of subsea cables would be laid, to the tune of $500 million. Last year, two of China's top telecom giants decided to step away from the plan and take back their almost 20 percent investment. Sources say the decision sparked after an American company was chosen over another Chinese firm for a key part of the project. That's as China competes with the United States for control of global undersea cables. They are a unique kind of infrastructure, tasked with transmitting about 95 percent of the world's intercontinental Internet traffic. That means cellular data, video calls, messages, emails and more. Around 400 cables are in active use today, spanning nearly 870,000 miles. Here's the trouble. Some have raised concerns about espionage, saying that the stations where the cables begin and end are at risk of getting intercepted by foreign adversaries and hackers. Back to the Simi V6 pipeline. A smaller Chinese state-owned company is also still in the plan, though China Unicom has not revealed its investment in the project. A number of non-Chinese companies are also working on it, like Microsoft, Orange, and Telecom Egypt. The project bears a similar scale to the Peace Cable, which links Singapore and France. That pipeline entirely constructed by Chinese companies. Washington has rejected a number of undersea cables since 2020. Officials cite national security concerns, given the lines directly link the U.S. to mainland China or Hong Kong. Construction on the new pipeline is expected to finish in 2025. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And just ahead, global leaders have arrived in Germany for the Munich Security Conference. This year's topics center on the war in Ukraine. And Spain passes a new law that allows people to change their gender identity on official documents starting at age 14 more shortly here on NTD News Today.
The Munich Security Conference kicks off today in Bavaria, Germany. The meeting is an annual gathering of experts, senior politicians, and heads of state for talks on global security policy. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and French President Emmanuel Macron have arrived at the venue to meet with other European leaders. Their speeches will follow opening remarks by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Also among the guests are UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, European Commission head Ursula von der Leyen, and NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Representing the US is Vice President Kamala Harris. Central to this year's security policy talks is the ongoing war in Ukraine. Debates are likely to cover European military buildup, defense spending, and the war's global impact on energy and food prices. This year, for the first time, the organizers didn't send invitations to Russia and Iran. Russian President Vladimir Putin met up with Belarus President Alexander Lukashenko today. The two got together at Putin's residence outside Moscow. Putin says the two leaders and their staff were set to discuss a range of issues, including security and defense. Lukashenko informed Putin that Belarus had made progress in manufacturing microelectronics, which is important as imports have dried up due to Western sanctions. The Belarusian leader also told Putin that his country was ready to assemble assault aircraft. The planes proved effective during the conflict in Ukraine. But Ukraine's president recently warned Lukashenko on BBC that his troops should not fight alongside Russia's. As European demand for U.S. weaponry soars, Scranton's Army Ammunition Plant in Pennsylvania is in hot demand to produce basic weapons and munitions. The demand includes 155 millimeter artillery rounds, air defenses, communications equipment, shoulder-fired javelin missiles, and drones. The Scranton plant is housed on over 15 acres with seven buildings and storage capacity of over 500,000 square feet. The focus on high volume, less costly weapons underscores how the war in Ukraine has reshaped strategic thinking in European capitals, especially regarding how future conflicts could be fought. Visions of high-tech wars reliant on computers have been replaced by the reality of relentless artillery duels and soldiers on the ground. Five European countries have expressed interest in American supplies, beginning a multi-step acquisition process. It could be a year or more before the weapons are actually delivered. National flags waved in Kosovo's capital as Kosovo celebrated 15 years of independence. The country seeks a normalization deal with Serbia and says it's crucial to stability in the region. The region is still recovering from the ethnic wars in the 1990s. Tensions with Serbia still linger. Roughly 50,000 minority Serbs in North Kosovo refuse to recognize the country's independence. Serbia still deems its former southern province an integral part of its territory, though the region is ruled by Kosovo. U.S. and European Union envoys are pressing the countries to approve a peace plan under which Serbia would stop lobbying against Kosovo having a seat in international organizations and Kosovo would provide more autonomy for Serbs in the north. President Biden has urged Kosovo to accept the peace deal. Normalization of relations is one of the key conditions for Serbia and Kosovo to progress towards EU membership. In Germany, over 2,000 flights were canceled today. That's as workers at seven major airports go on strike. Unionized workers are pressing for higher wages. They demand a 10% wage increase, or at least $500 a month. The union says there was little progress in bargaining efforts. They announced the strike on Wednesday. The union threatened more strikes and a summer of chaos if their demands are not being met. The cancellations are affecting almost 300,000 passengers. German airline Lufthansa previously said such strikes cost them over $10 million a day. The carrier declined to give an estimate of the cost of today's strike. A new law in Spain allows people to change their gender on identification documents from the age of 14. This is without the need for psychological or other medical appraisals. Spain's parliament gave the new trans law its final seal of approval yesterday. The bill has been heavily criticized by the conservative opposition, by activists, and some feminists. Critics say it puts women at risk because it could be used by predatory men to gain access to single-sex spaces such as toilets or changing rooms. Now turning our attention to the UK. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is meeting with Bill Gates to discuss their shared priorities. 
Their focus is net zero and sustainable investments. In a private meeting, they spoke about the strategic challenges facing the world. And today's Malcolm Hudson has more. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak on Wednesday met with Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates in central London. Sunak said he and Gates were discussing their shared priorities. I'm here at Imperial College with Bill Gates, where we've been talking about our shared priorities and securing the UK status as a science superpower. Also welcome today's announcement of billions of pounds of extra private funding for our best clean tech companies. Bill and I met some of the innovative startups here at Imperial College earlier. It's fantastic to see these researchers, scientists, business people solving the challenges of net zero and creating jobs in the process. The two global leaders met at Clean Tech for UK, a coalition aiming to open the door to a new generation of green technology startups. It's backed by more than £6 billion of private funding, and it's supported by Gates' sustainable energy programme, Breakthrough Energy. Sunak said the investment would help the UK meet net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and that the visit is tied with his desire to see more innovation in the economy to help spark growth. It comes after Sunak reshaped Whitehall earlier this month. He dismantled the former Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy to create three distinct departments for innovation, energy security and business. Sunak added that his priority to grow the economy means it's important to get the science and innovation right. Gates said, the UK has all the ingredients to become a major player in the global push to build a net zero emissions future. Despite being a vocal climate activist, Gates owns four private jets, a seaplane and a helicopter. He recently told the BBC he's not part of the problem, saying he invests in carbon capture technology to offset his family's emissions. Number 10 said Sunak and Gates also had a private meeting about the strategic challenges facing the world. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News. Members of European Parliament voted to ban petrol and diesel cars, but the switch to electric vehicles comes at a high cost. In France, while the government is dishing out subsidies to promote EVs, the electric transition is held by, back by a lack of charging stations. NTD's France correspondent David Vives has the story. The French government says by late spring, France will have 100,000 public electric vehicle charging stations installed. It would be a milestone for the country's electric mobility transition. 70% of electric vehicle owners charge their batteries at home and at night. But if they are to drive long distances, those charging points are essential. Despite the achievement, it's not a time to celebrate, though. Economist Philippe Murer says there are several issues the government fails to address. You are going to have some very practical problems that they don't think about. It costs a lot of money to install a charging station, to dig a hole, to install the station. When everyone goes on holiday on the road to Bordeaux or on the road to Marseille, everyone will have to recharge their electric cars at the same time. They will all have to find a charging station. You know that in California, while they have really pushed for electric cars and renewable energies, there are queues at times of 10 cars to reach the charging station, and there are journalists who have reported this problem. A recent study by European consultancy firm LCP Delta suggests France would need up to 650,000 public charging stations by 2030, eight times more than compared with today. Adding this number to the home charging points, there would be over 6 million stations across France, which would mean charging points as far as the eye can see. But there is more. 90% of existing charging stations are of low performance and deliver less than 22 kilowatt per hour. To meet the consumer's needs, that means recharging your car in 20 to 30 minutes, rapid charges would be required. Murer says that this would require a much more developed electric infrastructure. The other problem is that you are going to break the power grid, because when all the electric cars are charging with fast chargers to continue with their holiday journey, then you'll break the power grid. You'll never get a power grid powerful enough to do that. So take this, it hasn't even been thought through. Do you see the practical problems that this poses? To meet these electricity needs, 
The government says it will be necessary to build six additional nuclear reactors at the cost of over 40 billion pounds per year. That's the price to pay for the transition to electric mobility. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Coming up, it's carnival season in Venice, and gondoliers are hard at work shepherding passengers through the canals. The iconic hats are one of the strongest symbols of the floating city. A Moroccan museum finally reopens its doors to visitors after two years of renovations. The collection features the oldest necklace in the world. See that and more here on NTD News. A performance that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. Freedom is not free, and neither is the truth. In order to bring you the facts, our reporters are out there on the front lines getting the true story. Some of them served 10 years of prison in China. We've been censored on social media. Our Hong Kong printing offices were set on fire and we've been repeatedly attacked by the Chinese Communist Party. But no matter what, we believe that you deserve the truth and so we'll continue to bring the truth to light. Head on over to getepic.com and try honor journalism that is based in truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. Welcome back. With the carnival underway in Venice, gondoliers continue to shepherd passengers through the city's canals. Visitors can pick up reproductions of their famous straw hats from countless souvenir shops. But only the gondoliers know where to find the real thing. Entity's Andrew Thomas has the details on the boatman's iconic accessory. Juliana Longo has been making all kinds of hats for more than 50 years. Her family has been selling them since 1901. This colorful ribbon will be used to decorate the gondolier's famous straw hats. First, the hats are treated with a waterproof varnish, then they're adorned with the ribbon. The decoration, the ribbon, and the shape must all be precise because the hat has to shelter the wearer from the sun, from the wind. The ribbons can't be too long because otherwise they touch the face. There are rules for the aesthetics, rules of homogeneity, and technical rules for this hat. Today, the gondoliers all wear the same straw hat, conotto. Gondoliers' hats aren't the only style available. The shop boasts hats of all types from all eras. But the imaginative creations for Carnival stand out. Initially, Longo and her mother created eccentric hats for themselves during Carnival. My mother and I used to close our shop during the carnival and go to celebrate the carnival. We were then urged to produce for others the hats we were creating for ourselves. So we unleashed our creativity as milliners because a carnival hat is never too big, too small, too colorful. There is no such thing as too much. Carnival styles may be trendy, but the gondolier's hat remains one of the strongest symbols of the floating city. Andrea Balbi is president of the Gondoliers Association. He emphasized the hat's unique status in Italy. It's a uniform, and we are the only category in Italy that is not a military force that uses a uniform. It consists of a striped shirt that can be blue and white or red and white, black trousers and black shoes. The newer requirement, starting around the 1960s, is the straw hat. The bosses of the gondola stations must ensure gondoliers wear the correct uniform, as required by the city. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A museum in Morocco has finally reopened its doors to visitors after two years of renovations. One of the highlights of the collection is the oldest necklace in the world. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more on the ancient accessory. The Bismuth necklace is the oldest piece of jewelry in the world. It's on display at the National Finery Museum in Rabat, Morocco. 
The oldest piece displayed here is the Bisman necklace, which is the oldest jewelry in the world, not only in Morocco, and it dates back 150,000 years. It was discovered in recent excavations in the Bisman cave near Eswaria. Thanks to it, we can start studying it and learn about the development of historical jewelry. Before hosting exhibitions, the museum was a royal residence in the 17th century. The building was established as a princely residence in the 17th century by the Sultan, which was used as a princely residence for his son, who was then the governor of the city of Rabat. The building has an architectural character that mixes between the Moroccan character and the Andalusian character. The building has been a museum since 1915. It underwent renovations starting in early 2020 and ending in late 2022. The goal of the restoration and rehabilitation of the building was to meet all the appropriate standards for the approval of the museum displays and receive offers both at the national and international levels while respecting the characteristics of the building. Then there were workshops through which the selection, inventory and maintenance of the contents took place in order to enrich these exhibitions. In total, 8,000 pieces are on display in the museum. They range from jewelry to costumes, bags, belts and shoes. The museum contains different and diverse jewelry in its global concept, and it does not only include jewelry that was used for decoration, but there is also clothing, men's jewelry, in a varied exhibition divided into five parts through which we can learn about the history of jewelry, the tools of jewelry making, and their development. Since its reopening, the museum has welcomed more than 11,000 daily visitors. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. You're never too old for adventures. A UK care home resident has made her wish of riding on a zip line come true, but she took it to the next level by riding on the fastest zip line in the world. Sally Webster is an 85 year old resident from Dewater Grange Care Home in Chester, England. Together with her daughter Juliet, she zipped across the sky at a whopping 100 miles per hour in Wales on Tuesday. The nearly one mile long zip line at Zip World Velocity 2 near Bethesda in North Wales is the fastest in the world and the longest in Europe. But Sally is no stranger to the skies. She paraglided over Morzine in the French Alps when she was in her mid 60s. An initiative called Wishing Tree by Care UK allows care home residents to suggest new hobbies or activities they would like to try, making it possible for Sally to soar above the ground once again. Sally says the 500-foot above-ground experience was breathtaking. The elder says she was most fascinated by the views and would be more than happy to do it again. It took more than a century, but a letter addressed to a South London flat finally reached its destination. The current occupant, Finlay Glenn, saw the year 16 on the envelope and assumed it meant 2016, until he noticed the stamp featured King George V instead of Queen Elizabeth II. The letter was written by the daughter of a sea merchant and was addressed to the wife of a local stamp magnate with the salutation, My Dear Katie. She wrote about a family holiday in Bath and said she was suffering with a very heavy cold. A local magazine is putting together an article about the discovery, but what happened to the letter is still a mystery. Eating properly and staying active do more than help you live longer and feel better. They can also keep your eyesight sharper as you age. Here's Gina Marie with Strong Mind and Body. A lot of eye and vision problems can be prevented. All you have to do is form some healthy eye care habits. Let's go through some of the best things you can do every day to keep your vision sharp, starting with limiting eye rubbing. Hands and fingers are exposed to a lot of dirt, dust and bacteria. This can easily be transferred to your eyes when you touch them. If you have a pre-existing condition, rubbing your eyes can make it worse. Glaucoma can be aggravated by rubbing. It potentially disrupts blood flow to the eyes that may lead to nerve damage or vision loss. Next, let's talk about sunglasses. Skimping out on cheap supermarket sunglasses can cost you big time in the long run. Exposure to UV rays increases chances for age-related macular degeneration. This is the leading cause of vision loss. These harmful rays can also burn your cornea. Wearing UV protectant sunglasses and eyeglasses is the best way to protect your eyes. Next, you'll want to keep an eye on your diet. Focus on leafy greens and colorful fruits and vegetables, particularly orange, red, and green. 
Stick to whole foods as these can all help promote healthy vision and eyes. Stay away from processed foods and takeout. These are filled with toxic seed oils, sugar and refined wheat. Staying well hydrated helps also. Next, let's look at computers. Keep computer monitors and tablets at arm's length to prevent eye straining. Also, keep screens at roughly 20 degrees below eye level or at eye level. And finally, get active. The more active you are, the healthier your eyes are. Activity helps to lower the risk for type 2 diabetes and heart disease, two conditions with a heavy influence on your vision. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.